Best Darn Diddly is moving, everyone. That's right, we've got our own website at bestdarndiddly.com. You can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. So go to bestdarndiddly.com where you can stay up to date on the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Moe's Days Off, and today we are talking about Homer's Triple Bypass. That's three. And joining me once again, your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How are you today, Rich? As always, I'm fine and dandy like sour candy. I uh, may not think the episode is as fine and dandy as I am today, but it's still an enjoyable one nonetheless. But as usual, you know we're going to get into that. For now, I'll throw it back to you, the man, the myth, the MTV generation, eh, it's Mr. Most Days Off. That was my favorite joke in the entire episode. However, (laughs) are you saying you did not enjoy this episode, sir? Is that what I'm hearing? I said that it was an enjoyable episode. That's literally what I just said, but the new precedent that's been set after the last few episodes, this one did not live up to it, in my opinion. Interesting. See, once again, I was thinking this is an absolute contender for my top five. I thought it was it was great. All 22 episodes or whatever this season are going to be contenders for your top five. Let's be honest. Eh, Probably not the clip show, but we'll we'll (laughs) see. You haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. I might be really excited about it, but no, uh, I did. I did really like this one. So let's talk about it and, and figure out where we disagree. This one, as we mentioned, is called Homer's Triple Bypass. It is the actual four-year anniversary of the show, because this one did debut on December 17th, 1992. Again, four years to the day in which the Simpsons series debuted. We are aging fast here, sir. Yeah, man, it is going really quick. In fact, this one might be the last episode in 1992. Yep, the next one's January 14th. Marge versus the Monorail. Woohoo! It debuted January 14th in 1993. So that'll be the very, very first entry into 1993, and we'll be joined by all three Rassel Nerds, now the Derailers podcast hosts. Those guys are just all over the internet, but they'll be with us next week to talk about that. And we'll prove that even with three of them, they can't overpower us on our own show. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't sure if that was their intention. Do you guys have some sort of feud going on that I don't know about? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'll just keep killing all of them as uh, Jason on Friday the 13th, the game. I was about to say, do you get in a fight with a Canadian is kind of like getting in a fight with a chick. Like, even if you win, what does it really prove? I don't know. Some chicks can hit pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, so, this episode opens up with the chalk gag, coffee is not for kids. And I love the more Bart writes, the jitterier and jitterier it becomes. Like, the, the, <laughs> it becomes almost illegible because his hand is shaking so badly as he writes. Which is really funny because nowadays, I swear to God, I was at the mall this last weekend with my wife and there is like two 10-year-old girls in front of us ordering coffee. It's fucking ridiculous. Ugh. It's just making me think of the Futurama episode where Fry has 100 cups of coffee now. <laughs> well, the couch gag actually made me think of a Rick and Morty episode, Tiny Rick, because it was Tiny Simpsons who came running out during the couch gag and uh, just made me laugh. I'm going to shout out to Pickle Rick right now. Pickle That's Rick for season for. three. <laughs> I can't wait, man. The actual episode opens up with cops in Springfield. Bad cops, bad cops. Bad cops, bad cops. Springfield cops are on the take. But what do you expect from the money we make? Bad cops, bad cops. Bad cops, bad cops. Whether in a car or on a horse. We don't mind using excessive force. Bad cops. Bad bad cops. cops. (laughs) Oh, that cracked me up. Uh, The commentary (laughs) did clue me into the fact that when you see the Simpsons opening up on Homer watching television, one, it's just a very easy transition piece into the episode, and two, it's very easy to manipulate the time if they need to fill up the episode a little bit more, or trim a bit if they uh, ended up writing more scenes. In this case... It was a very long opening segment, so they, uh, they were trying to fill a little bit of time. <laughs> what really kind of grinded my gears about this opening shot where they're watching Springfield Cops is it showed the, the police, or it showed Wiggum and Lou and Eddie going after Snake, 
And this is like this. This is the second episode in the last like two or three where they've thrown out seven forty two Evergreen Terrace and not had it reference the Simpsons. They really like that number. They just have not planted it to the Simpsons' home because yeah, they actually show up and try to bust Snake, but they hit uh, they hit Reverend Lovejoy's house instead. And when they ask if this is seven forty two Evergreen Terrace, he points next door and Snake's fleeing away. It's weird though that they're just throwing that address around. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's we're almost we're halfway through season four, and it's not the Simpsons' address quite yet. I also really enjoyed the montage of scenes we got for the show Cops in Springfield. It was like Wiggum unsuccessfully talking a guy off the ledge, and then you actually see some guys chase down and apprehend a suspect. But it turns out that was just the Springfield cops watching cops. <laughs> <laughs> They're frisking Jasper and getting all yeah. these weapons out of his beard. Brass knuckles, a handgun, a grenade, and a knife. My absolute oh, favorite, though, is it shows them in action in the Springfield Police helicopter, but when it zooms out, it turns out they're just using it to get a good view of the drive-in movie, which was playing, yet again, space one mutants. of the Space Mutants movies. <laughs> Unclear which one this time. We pan out to see Homer watching this show in bed, and he is just surrounded by food. He's actually got a turkey leg in his hand. There's for sure a pizza, a cake... Uh, I'm probably thinking there was a sandwich, but I may be making that part up or thinking of the lockjaw scene later. But there's definitely a liter of Diet Cola next to him, that's for sure. At least he's being somewhat safe. This is like every American's dream right here, but then you're also going to see the consequences of your dreams here in a few moments. But like, everyone wishes they could do this all the time. I don't know, man. I don't really get the whole eating in bed thing. I, I've never really enjoyed that. You just end up with crumbs in your bed, and that doesn't seem cool. That's part of the consequences, I'm saying. <laughs> oh, I thought you just meant the fact that his heart's about to fucking explode. <laughs> I could never eat, like, laying down. Just the, the, the whole swallowing portion when you're laying down just would be really weird for me. It's very strange. It's very strange. Uh, while Homer is actually eating the turkey and Marge is kind of pointing out that he eats, he's eating way too much, Homer clearly gets chest pains at one point, but he says he's just passing the turkey through and everything seems okay afterwards. When he walks downstairs, the kids are having breakfast and Bart is being a little turd to Lisa, but it's kind of funny. I actually, uh, other than this, I've never seen this joke, but... He asks Lisa if she wants to see the victims from last night's train wreck, and when she agrees, he of course does the whole chewed food in his mouth bit. <laughs> the part that really pushed it over the line is when he's like, when she complains, he's like, you're right, we should just bury them out and see, and he spits it into her cereal. Oh, oh. oh. As you might expect, Lisa screams at Bart just as Homer comes in through the kitchen, and he actually clutches his chest once again and ask the kids if they know that feeling of a thousand hot needles being pushed through their chest. <laughs> but then he gets uh, distracted by bacon. <laughs> clear symptom of a heart attack. Marge surprises him with a special treat. She decided to make him a nice healthy breakfast of oatmeal. Ugh. Unfortunately, though, there's a bug in it. You <laughs> Time to throw that whole thing out. Well, it turns out there really isn't a bug in it. Marge is even telling him so, but he just insists <laughs> that it has to be thrown away. But the best part is immediately afterwards, he's eating a plate of bacon and eggs, it looks like. And the kids point out that there actually is a bug in it. And he's just like, meh, yeah. keeps eating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and how, how are you supposed to pass up bacon and eggs for breakfast? It's like the best breakfast. Uh, the only it's thing so that completes it is pancakes. Or if you're feeling foreign, waffles are also fine. Uh, I like sausage. Ah! Oh, sorry. I bet you do. Fuck you. Wait, <laughs> no. That would only prove your point. Never mind. <laughs> Homer's day is not getting any less stressful as he's late to work and stuck behind a slow-ass truck, which is actually pulling the birth home of Edgar Allan Poe, and it's being driven by Hans freaking Mole Man. The worst person to be driving that thing. What I don't understand is like, Homer is just going to town on this thing. Like, why would you do that to your car? Homer's stressed out and cursing, and he's actually bumping with his vehicle the rear bumper of this house. But the really strange part is it actually causes the house to burst into flames, and then Hans <laughs> Mole Man drives off a cliff. Very, very dark and tragic moment. Not going to be the last time we see that. 
Well, Hans Moleman always finds a way to survive, but this is just like every action movie, though, where things blow up or catch on fire for absolutely no reason. I actually, uh, it reminds me of that scene in 21 Jump Street, the remake movie. Yes. That, uh, it's fantastic yes. at the end when they keep expecting things to blow up and nothing ever does. I really thought that was going to catch on fire. <laughs> I know, right? If this were a movie, that's exactly what would have happened. <laughs> Homer gets concerned as he's driving. He starts to hear an irregular thumping sound, so he stops by the mechanic to get it checked out. Good news, though. It's not his transmission. It's just his heart. Woo, I was worried it was my transmission. (laughs) Homer drives to work, and yet again, things are going from bad to worse because he's lounging around, per usual, eating donuts, and Monty Burns is watching him via the camera and actually calls him into the office, which causes homer even more stretch look at that pig stuffing his face with donuts on my time that's right keep eating little do you know you're drawing ever closer to the poison donut there is a poison one isn't there smithers well actually sir i talked to our lawyers and they considered it murder (laughs) damn their oily hides Oh, uh, that's a great line. And that, that proves your uh, point. We always talk about how great Monty Burns is. And <laughs> that very well may have just kind of been too confusing for me as a kid, especially this next part. But God damn it, he's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> the next scene is actually Homer in his office. And it's great because like it keeps going back and forth. And, and this happens a lot with Mr. Burns, actually. I've seen uh, several scenes where they do this and just and just jokes in The Simpsons in general. But it starts out, uh, Mr. Burns tells Homer, relax, we're just here to chat about how awful you are on your job. And like, um, the best part of this whole scene is they actually have a picture in picture of an up close shot of Homer's heart. And you can see it going from relaxing to thumping out of control and, and clearly being on the verge of a heart attack. Things keep getting worse and worse and worse till finally Burns says, you are infantious, to which Homer kind of looks stumped, and he's like, that means you're terrible at your job, and then he, uh, he actually ends up having a heart attack. <laughs> Mr. Burns, I think he's dead. Oh dear, send a ham to his widow. And then Homer's spirit goes, mmm, ham, and it goes back into his body, and he goes, no wait, he's alive. Oh good, <laughs> cancel the ham. Don't! <laughs> uh... Great little subtle part about that scene that uh, was pointed out to me in the director's commentary. If you watch, you'll notice that Homer's toe actually always remains in his body, signifying that he was close to death, but never completely dead. Oh, wow. That's a cool little thing there. Yeah, I thought that was really neat. When he's in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, they have to come to a stop for a deer crossing the road. And I love the ambulance driver is like, huh, how do they know where to cross? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> at the hospital we see a very packed waiting room with some very uh funny cameos including Jacques, who got his thumb stuck in a bowling ball willie has both of his hands and arms bandaged up i wonder if he's been fighting wolves again jasper got his beard completely entangled into his bike spokes <laughs> ouch that actually sounds really painful if they would have left all those weapons in there then that wouldn't have happened <laughs> it was it was his defense mechanism <laughs> Uh, my personal favorite, Karate Guy had his hand halfway through a board and it seemed to be stuck. <laughs> uh, uh, Pooh was in there. It looked like he may have been the victim of a gunshot wound, which is pretty routine for him. Krusty and Mel, they had Sideshow Mel stuck in a cannon and he assured them that firing the cannon wouldn't work, but they tried it anyway and he was right. <laughs> and finally... All of the cops, the Springfield cops, were in the waiting room. It turned out that Chief Wiggum was trying to take a bite out of his oversized sandwich, and he ended up getting lockjaw. I love that uh, Officer Lou keeps putting his entire fist into Wiggum's mouth, and like <laughs> it, it, the whole thing will fit. And they keep laughing about it. This is apparently based on a real life incident with Daniel Stern, who rumor has it actually got lockjaw while eating a sandwich on the production set one day. Huh. That was not confirmed by any of the people on commentary, including Matt Groening, Al Jean, and Mike Reese, uh, along with the writer and director of this episode, Mike Carrington, and David Silverman, but all of them had heard that rumor independently, so it's a a (laughs) wild rumor 
that that is based on a real life incident. Oh, think about the first time you see you watch that episode after they put it in there, and you're just like, "What the hell?" <laughs> Uh, what a, a fun way to rib your friends. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's very serious. Homer is actually having a heart attack. And, and that actually brings up another point just in general. We talk about this all the time. This is something that's quite amazing that the Simpsons seem able to do in a very special way where they take these very, very heavy, heavy subjects and they make them... Very funny, and they use it have enough levity that you enjoy watching. But this was such a serious condition when both the writer and director, as I mentioned, Mike Carrington and David Silverman, when they were told they would be working on this episode, their first instinct was that it was a joke when they were told that Homer was going to be having a heart attack. They said there's absolutely no way they're going to have the lead character have a heart attack on camera. Like they just, they, they, they both thought they were being ribbed. Uh, but turned out they were picked because they thought that these two would be the team to make this this funny. And uh, I, I have to say, I think they did a good job. Well, you didn't just have one heart attack. No, he had quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess they were right in a way. So this very serious news is taken very seriously by Marge when she receives a phone call from the hospital that her husband's had a heart attack. She was clipping coupons with Patty and Selma at the time that the phone rang. When she announces she needs to rush to the hospital, Patty and Selma are like, oh my god, there's five cents off of wax paper. No way. <laughs> Those two are just so awful to him. We talk mm. about it all the time, there, including I, was, later in the week. Yeah, movie. that part was really dark later on, like much more so than it was when I was a child seeing this. Yeah, uh, we'll just go ahead and talk about it. When Homer's in surgery later, Patty and Selma actually try to set Marge up with somebody while she's in the waiting room for her husband's surgery. She has to remind them that her husband's alive, and they're like, oh, yeah, we sure hope he makes it through. And the sleazy guy straight up says, I don't. I don't. Yeah, like, that's like <laughs> what the fuck? That's fucked up, man. <laughs> Dr. Hibbert is giving the shock paddle treatment to Homer, and Homer keeps asking for more. A little more, a little more. Yeah, he's uh, laying down is. on the table with his eyes closed, using his hands, saying, like, come on, come on, give me more. <laughs> he actually mentions that his life flashed before his eyes, all the way back to when he was just a baby in the hospital. Somehow he managed to get a slice of pizza into his little <laughs> bucket thing the, that they keep the newborns in. Yeah. yeah, he's in, like, Grandpa Simpson Abe is actually looking through the viewing area. He's like, how did he get a pizza? And the nurse just shrugs. Mm -hmm. It goes on to when he was singing in his church choir. He sang like an angel, Richie, and Abe thought this was going to be his million dollar ticket. He's going to make me a millionaire. To ride his voice to the top. And just about then, Homer's voice changed. He hits puberty, and it's we got the voice that we now know that is not Christ angelic upon the ears when he's singing. Says the Lord. <laughs> and then Grandpa, I love Grandpa's reaction. He's just like, "Dag nabbit." <laughs> This is somewhat reminiscent of something that happened to me. I was never a great <laughs> singer, but prior to puberty, I actually had a pretty good singing voice. So much to the point that I got the lead role. It was, I'm sorry, the lead antagonist role. So I played the bad guy. I was a silver tongued producer from Hollywood named Freddie Fast Talk. And I actually, uh, it was a musical that we sang. This was all the way back in like middle school. But right about that time, my voice changed, like, mid-production. So somewhere at my folks' home, I have a VHS tape of me very poorly singing a as a villain in a school play. What musical was that? Uh, it was, I don't remember what it was called, but it was about a snowman that came to life at Christmas, uh, very ripping off uh, Frosty. Oh, I thought then, you were being sarcastic. <laughs> no, no, totally true story, <laughs> totally true story. But my character came in, it was kind of a spoof on Frosty the Snowman, and uh, my character came in and tried to convince the kid that made friends with them to, like, sell out his friends so they could make it big <laughs> in Hollywood. I don't remember how it ended, but my character eventually, I think, got chased out of the building by cops or something like that. It just sounds like a Simpsons character to me, Freddy Fastfingers or whatever. <laughs> Freddy Fast Talk. Freddy yeah. Fast Talk, yeah. There was some Simpsons-esque humor to it, I would say. I mean, for as much as you can put on in like fifth or sixth grade. I, I honestly don't remember exactly how old I was, but whatever age you are when your voice starts to crack, it was uh, that when <laughs> that seemed to happen to me. But yeah, Homer is relieved that he made it because obviously anything that doesn't kill you will make you stronger, right? No, that's never true. 
Unless you don't die and you become stronger. I think it's usually true, but in this case, Dr. Hibbert points out that he's very much weak as a baby. He actually starts picking on him and poking on him, say, <laughs> like, just making fun of him and how weak he is. And Homer just, like, meekly cringes and, like, tells him, stop, stop, please, leave me alone. Did you hear what Homer actually said? He said, remember your hippopotamus oath. <laughs> yes. The last thing he says is he's being tickled. Please, please have mercy. Remember your hippopotamus oath. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember catching that when I was younger. <laughs> oh, fantastic line. Dr. Hibbert alerts Homer that while they don't have the technology to prevent him from having another heart attack, they can tell him exactly how bad his heart is. <laughs> Boy, what an age. Damn straight. <laughs> they decide they're going to do some tests. First up, Homer's going to stand behind an x-ray screen. They're going to inject him with some dye. That will cause his blood to glow and they can see exactly how it's flowing. But when they put him behind the machine, his blood is already glowing before they even give him the shot. Which is a great little joke about him working at a nuclear power plant, of course. (laughs) There's so many more wrong things with him than just the heart attack. His blood is literally glowing, like radioactively. Yes, it's it's terrifying. Nuclear power, it's the way of the future. (laughs) Dr. Hibbert also does a test to determine his body fat. It's called the jiggle test. How it works, he starts the jiggle, and then he times to see when it stops. Once he gets his belly moving, I love Homer's like, wow, look at that flubber fly. And Dr. Hibbert's just like, "Mm, yes, nurse, cancel my one (laughs) o'clock. It is determined that Homer is going to need open heart surgery. Homer doesn't quite grasp the concept, and he keeps asking him to explain it again. Finally, Dr. Hibbert's like, we're going to open you up and tinker with your ticker. And Homer's like, could you dumb that down just a bit more? (laughs) (laughs) He then discloses it's going to cost $30,000, which causes Homer to have another Homer, (laughs) which causes a Homer attack, (laughs) which causes Homer to have another heart attack, which bumps up the price to $40,000. I like that little moment, though, because, like, when they first say it's going to be 30000 it goes to outside the hospital, and then you hear Homer go, like, uh, 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 and he goes, that's going to be 40000 uh, I just loved how they did that, but for the record, I wanted to say, like, I've had my appendix taken out, and that whole procedure with everything that followed afterwards was a lot more expensive than what they were asking to do for this, so in 1992 dollars, I know it's it's a lot of money, but it doesn't seem so bad by today's standards. Well, in the commentary, they said that that was actually ballpark the correct amount of money in that at that time. Actually, the director, David Silverman's dad, is a doctor. They used him as a consultant for a lot of the medical industry questions they had when they were doing this. A lot of the, the surgical stuff, and, and in this case, how much the cost would be. So we find the true reason why he was picked to direct this episode. Not Probably the case. It, it was funny. just, yeah, they just knew that they, they needed his help to, to get the facts straight. <laughs> It's all about who you know, people. (laughs) So the Simpsons are back at home. Marge and Homer are in bed discussing their finances. (laughs) Homer's like, how much do we have in the checking account? Marge replies, $70. And do we have any pending $40,000 checks? (laughs) (laughs) No. (laughs) I love that line. Marge is like, what about your health care? Surely you have some insurance from work. But Homer tells them they traded it for a pinball machine in the break room. Good choice. <laughs> Marge, don't worry. America's health care is only second in the world to Japan, Canada, Sweden, Great Britain. Well, all of Europe. But you can thank your lucky stars we don't live in Paraguay. <laughs> Next up, we see Homer actually going to talk with the Merry Widow Insurance Company, which has a fucking great sign. It's horrible, but hilarious, because it's like one of those neon signs that flashes to two different scenes, and one of them shows a widow crying next to her husband's grave, and the next one has her dancing on it. With a with a money symbol, I think. Yeah, yeah, she's got cash in her hand, making it rain. Homer is filling out the paperwork, but they've got a few questions, and he starts to panic when they say so. Then he's like, no, no, questions, it's fine. Well, sir, it shows here that you had marked that you had three heart attacks and crossed it out and put zero. 
<laughs> oh, I, I thought that said brain aneurysms. <laughs> the guy just gives them the weirdest look. Whenever uh, they said, okay, everything's in order, they start to hand over the paperwork, and Homer's like, ah, well, you suckers, I just fooled you. And they're like, wait, wait, you have to yeah, sign, sign it first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, God, he's so Homer in this moment. <laughs> Then worst of all, he actually starts to have a heart attack in the middle of signing. So they get this great scene where the insurance agent and Homer are having a tug of war. Homer is trying to sign before he has the heart attack, and they're trying to prevent him from doing so. And they I put an H on win. there. It counts as an X. <laughs> uh. They are nice enough, however, to both call 911 and give him a free calendar. So, you know, it wasn't the end of the world. Can I have the free calendar? Okay. <laughs> Once again at the hospital, Homer is getting him a bump of those electrical paddles. Just uh, Actually, at one point he grabs them himself and just starts charging his heart. Which I wonder how many times you can do that before you're actually declared dead. I guess we need David Silverman's father here to tell us that. I like that Homer clearly has an NDE here, a near-death experience, because he comes out of his death, essentially, talking about how he is in such a warm place with fire and brimstone and little <laughs> men in PJs who are poking him in the butt. <laughs> They're just trying to wake him up, right? Dr. Hibbert assures Homer that he really needs to have this surgery. So Homer is desperate, and he starts looking toward religion for money. Any religion, really. He starts at his own with Reverend Lovejoy. <laughs> then he's quickly on to Rabbi Krostovsky. He starts to talk to a Hindi religious leader. I, I don't know what they'd be called, but, you know, somebody that's on that level. And he just gives up halfway no, through good, that No good, sir. One. You're on the level. <laughs> you're getting Flash ahead of yourself. Yeah, you're ahead of yourself. <laughs> The only thing Homer got, though, from requesting money from the major religions was the Jewish faith gave him a droodle. <laughs> As Homer calls it. Yeah. <laughs> Maggie seemed to really enjoy the droodle, too. But just then, perhaps their prayers were answered after all. Because Dr. Nick, hi, everybody, pops on the hi, TV Dr. screen. Nick. And he will do any surgery. For only $129.99. And if you come in for brain surgery, you get a free Chinese finger trap. <laughs> like th That price is so low that, oh my gosh. It's terrifying. Yeah. I love though Homer's like, eh, boring. And Marge is like, no, Homer, this might be what we need. He should know TV always has the answers. A fun little fact about this segment the phone number they put up at the end is 1-600-DOCTORB. The B is for bargain. It was actually originally 1-800-DOCTORB, but it turns out that there is a real-life doctor with the number 1-800-DOCTOR-B, and it caused <laughs> him quite a bit of problem. So in all syndication and even my DVD set, it's changed to 1-600-DOCTORB, which is the area code for Northern Canada. That's why it's so cheap. <laughs> For $130, it's hard to pass up, but Homer decides it's time to tell the kids what's going on. There's this joke we referenced earlier. Homer's afraid he's going to upset the kids, but Lisa explains they're part of the MTV generation. They can't experience highs or lows. What's that like? Eh. Yeah, I love that. It's a perfect 90s kid reaction. Yeah. With just the right amount of 90s tood. I actually really like what Bart says after they talk about, you know, Homer possibly dying. And it actually looks like it upsets Bart, which it always makes me happy when you see Bart's true emotions. Just so that, you know, he's not always a little devil. But I like <laughs> it when he says, what if they botch it? I won't have a dad for a while. Because let's be honest, Marge will find another man pretty quick. That was dark, though. Yeah, there's like a long pause and he's like, for a while. It won't. Marge will have people lining up left and right. Now they're going to all be Springfieldians, which there's not that many good ones. But I mean, she'll be fine. I think she'll bounce back just fine. I also really liked how Homer decided he wasn't going to sugarcoat it when he was telling the kids, and then the, he was just going to tell it to him straight. And then the very next scene, he's doing a little puppet show trying to explain <laughs> how how it's going to work inside of his body. Lisa, of course, understands it perfectly, and she actually even starts studying heart surgery at this point. <laughs> We trust you have a coronary transplant, whatever, blah, blah, blah. What if you die? 
Oh, honey, only bad people die. <laughs> what about Abraham Lincoln? Oh, well, he poisoned a bunch of people's milk. <laughs> Homer! What? I was just trying to comfort them. <laughs> Damn that Abe Lincoln. So Homer is off to get his surgery. He's checked into the hospital, and he's having a grand old time with his bed that's got the controller that raises it up and down. Bed, bed goes, goes up, up, bed, bed goes, goes down. down. Bed goes up, bed goes down. Homer Simpson! Guess who's next to him in bed? I love the reason, too. Uh, Ned Flanders is once again his neighborino. And when Homer <laughs> asks why he's there, Ned's just donating his lung and his kidney to whoever needs it first. Oh, I, but I need a new heart. Well, if I could, I'd donate it to and you. Isn't Ned so sweet? He is, of course. I I love when Flanders actually hears him and says, "Homer Simpson, if that don't put the de- or if that don't put the dink in Kawinky dink." <laughs> <laughs> Freaking Flanders and Burns in this episode, always good, always good. Doctor Nick's also great. He comes into the hospital room and immediately uh, is paged to go see the coroner, and he's like, "Oh man, again." i mean for 130 dollars you get what you pay for right when he goes back out the hallway it's just nothing but pressing cameras and he decides he's gonna take the other route and jumps out the window (laughs) yeah dr nick's always funny uh after that we actually hear ned flanders praying which isn't unusual I i do love though included in his prayers are shaking it to the oldies volume one two and four uh, clearly, Volume 3 must have had a little bit too much blaspheme in it. Volume 3 didn't sunshine sparkle. <laughs> However, we also see Homer praying, which is a little more out of character. Uh, I, I love that the nurse actually comes in and stops him and just points to the sign that in fact says, no praying. <laughs> yeah, what hospital is that? <laughs> Speaking of praying, we're at Sunday school the next morning, and it opens up with why God causes train wrecks. Uh, the first line you hear is, and that's why God causes train wrecks. So you don't actually know why. Uh, we just caught the end of that conversation. Would have loved to hear that that story. <laughs> Lisa asks her Sunday school teacher, she, she talks about her dad being sick and wants to know what will happen if he dies. You'll all go to hell. Go to hell, go to she hell. She starts talking about how if he's a good person, he'll go to heaven and he'll get to do whatever he wants to do. And then immediately we see Lisa picturing him on a cloud. Cloud go up, cloud go down. Cloud, cloud go up, up cloud, cloud go down. down. Cloud goes up, cloud goes down. <laughs> hey, there's worse ways to spend your days, right? I would have clouds in heaven too if it were real, but they'd be much, much different clouds. <laughs> Back at the hospital, Homer's getting some visitors. First up, we have Krusty the Clown. Oh my god, I I loved this part, and it's something that just... <laughs> <laughs> it gets to you the older you are. Like you just kind of watch it and just ha ha as a kid. No, it's it, fucked up now. I mean, yeah, doing, you, now that you know yeah, what it really means, it's really dark. Yeah, he's saying he's doing community service, and he looks at Homer's chart and sees what's going on. He's like, "Oh wow!" And he's like, "Oh, what do you need community so- service for?" And he goes, "Oh, you know, a little glug glug, and then the vroom vroom, and then thump thump." <laughs> <That's so cute. laughs> Fucking hit somebody with his car. <laughs> And all Homer says afterwards is like, oh, good, you're here. I could use a laugh. And then Krusty's like, there's nothing funny about what you're going through. I'm part of the zipper club myself. Oh, I just, I can't get that. That's fucked up, dude, but funny as fuck, but in a dark, dark way. I also really like after that, Homer's like, well, you seem okay. And Krusty's like, oh, yeah, this ain't makeup. (laughs) Well, then also when we get Barney and Moe in there. I mean, the Simpsons were approving sex changes back in 1992. They were on board with it. <laughs> Barney was against it at first, but if Homer wants to be a woman, then he supports him. In fact, he bought him a jumbo bikini. <laughs> <laughs> he's disappointed that he won't have a use for it since uh, Homer explains he's having a heart attack. Also, uh, Mo brings sneaks him in a beer, but he reminds him after he's about halfway through that, that beer ain't free. Which, that might be one of the worst things for him to be drinking in his current Well, it couldn't be any worse than Krusty <laughs> having a cigarette after he was talking about his. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we also have Abe Simpson visit, and a great, another dark joke, but really funny. Abe starts talking about how they say there's nothing worse than a father outliving their child. He's never really understood that. He can see some upside to it himself. Oh. <laughs> and then Lenny and Carl... Uh, they also come by. They brought a card signed by everybody at work. 
They had a really hard time replacing him, and then they flashed to his booth, and you just see a brick tied to one of the levers to hold it in place. What I liked was they said they gave him a card, and when Homer reads the card, you see the back of the card, and it's actually the the safety sign from work. <laughs> so they literally had everybody sign it. I forgot what it said. It's something that says, like, don't remove this sign or something like that, or, like, caution, and it was clearly the safety sign from work. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, Lisa has been studying heart surgery herself. Marge is a bit concerned, but it seems to be helping Lisa process things. It's a little bit alarming, however, when Lisa actually got a heart from the butcher shop, a cow's heart, to be fair, and dumps it out on the table to study it. Yeah, to me, though, like that's it makes sense. Like you said, it comforts Lisa and she just wants to know everything that's going on. And under the hands of a competent doctor, there might not be so much worry on this part, but it totally makes sense for a character why she would go through these processes. Well, through. Processes. And it's, as we'll find out later, it's a damn good thing she does. Good for you, Lisa Simpson. Thanks, little girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, little girl. While Lisa's studying heart surgery herself, Dr. Nick is watching a how-to video. But <laughs> unfortunately, about halfway through, it turns out, he taped it over with people that look like things. What I liked is while he's watching the video, he, it shows the doctor like covered in blood after he's cutting them open. He's like, Ew, Ew blood! blood. <laughs> <laughs> the talk show host and the people who look like things segment was really funny too, because when he's asking the, the people what they want, they're just like, we just want some respect and dignity. The guy actually looks like a pumpkin, and the talk show host is like, and maybe an occasional candle. And the guy's like, yes, an occasional candle. Hey, stop that! <laughs> ba -da -bum, ba -dum -bum. <laughs> well, it's the day of the surgery and things are getting real. Homer's saying not necessarily goodbye, but you know, just just saying something to all of his family just in case. Starts out with him hugging Maggie, but immediately he's like, "Ew, stinky pants," <laughs> and pushes her away. He starts to talk with Marge about remarrying and Marjorie assures him, "No, honey, I could never." And he's like, "You damn right you wouldn't. In fact, I want you to get me stuffed and keep me on the couch as a reminder of our marriage <laughs> vows. Which that would do it. And I mean, that's pretty much where Homer stays most of the time, so it might be comforting to the children. There you go. It's in Papa's lap. And not at all unhealthy. No, no. It's not like Psycho at all. He decides he wants to share a few words of wisdom with Bart and Lisa, but he struggles to come up with any. Lisa whispers something very sweet to say to Bart into his ear. He talks about how no matter what, with or without him, he knows that Bart's going to turn out great. When it's Bart's turn to whisper some nice things for Homer to say about Lisa, he says, Lisa, it's time for me to tell you. I guess it's the time to tell you. <laughs> you are adopted, and I don't like you. Yeah. Bart! <laughs> this is probably my favorite little moment in the episode here with the kids whispering words to for homer to say on their behalf to their sibling like this whole little moment is just really really sweet especially after that when when bart whispers something else and it's just like lisa you just know that your big brother is always here to take care of you and like this is a very like sweet little moment in in a comedic way so they did kind of pull it off here because homer's not thinking any of these things on his own the kids are saying it but it's just it's so homer bart and lisa it fits the relationship perfectly, and it's a very sweet moment between the all three of them at the same time, which usually right. you get the one-on-one -on -one tender moments with Homer and Lisa, or sometimes Homer and Bart, and sometimes Bart and Lisa, yeah, but and rarely do you get with just Lisa the being them. so much smarter than both of them, like, it just fits so perfectly in this little moment. Also, what I like is the last thing Homer hears before he passes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dr. Nick is actually performing this surgery in front of an observation room. Now, if something should go wrong, let's not get the law involved. One hand washes the other. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. <laughs> and then when he's wash done washing his hands, he's like, these rubber gloves came free with my toilet brush. And then to go even further, when Homer's going under and his eyes are closing, the last thing he hears is Dr. Nick go, what the hell is that? <laughs> That line was written by them trying to decide what would be the absolute worst thing you could hear, right? Be going why, as you pass out going into surgery. <laughs> like as Homer's eyes are shutting. Oh my god! How terrifying! Yeah. Oh, this is when we get that scene in the waiting room we talked about, where Patty and Selma introduce sleazeball Andre to Marge, and she has to remind them that she's still married and her husband's going to survive this. I hope he doesn't. 
At the bar, Mo leads a moment of silence for Homer, and it lasts about six seconds until Barney asks how long it's been, and then they're like, do we have to start over? And Mo's like, hell no! <laughs> <laughs> Apu actually is reflecting on how it might be his fault that his friend is in trouble, and maybe it's all those salty snack goods that he keeps selling them that's caused his health issues. Just then a customer comes in and asks, can I get some beef jerky? Would you like some vodka with that? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> nice to know that the Quickie Mart has liquor on hand, too. Right? That'd be super convenient. Yeah, what a convenience store. Right? <laughs> but I actually really like the fact, like, when that scene first starts, that even a poo cares. It's sweet that there's, like, such a tight-knit community in Springfield that they actually do care about one another from time to time. I mean, it's totally plot point specific at times when they need it to happen. But it's still nice to think that that type of thing still exists in this world. That just reminded me of a story I heard about Johnny Depp here recently. Not not all the other crap about people being mad at him and stuff, but like him telling a story when his car broke down in, uh, was it Richardson? It was somewhere near here where his car broke down and random people who didn't know him stopped, helped him tow his car to a mechanic, and then took him to lunch at the diner across the street. And they all had sandwiches together and he said, that was the best damn sandwich I've ever had in my life. And he goes, they never knew who I was. They were very, very kind. And he said, I would like to think that like, if I, when I retire one day, I could go to that place and live. He goes, I didn't realize there were still towns like that left in America. But he said it was like one of the most pleasant experiences of his life with something bad happening. That is a really sweet story. And I'm glad to know that there are towns like that in America, too. You know, I think it's more so people like that more than towns, yeah. to be completely yeah. honest. But it's still cool that that type of thing exists. Back at the surgery, though, Dr. Nick is struggling. He's trying to remember back to med school, but all he can remember is when he was hitting on chicks by saying, hey, baby, I can prescribe anything I want. Wow. Which, to be fair, that line would work on me. <laughs> Dr. Nick starts singing the leg bones connected to the hip bone. The hip bones connected to the something. The something's connected to the red thing. The red thing's connected to my wristwatch. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, such a good song. <laughs> well, that's after Lisa helps out, though. Oh, uh, yeah, during this, actually, to give him confidence while he's trying to remember back to med school, Lisa actually calls down and tells him where to cut because he clearly didn't remember. Yeah, he's sweating bullets and she says, below the blockage, I think. Below, below the blockage. Below the blockage. Thanks, little girl. <laughs> Thanks to the assist from Lisa, the operation was a success. Andy's got a new ticker because of the watch. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> you corny asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yes, corn comes out your asshole. Oh, oh, and then do we get to a quick visit from another patient of Dr. Nick. <laughs> Mr. McGregor. he had a leg for an arm and an arm for a leg. <laughs> Oh, hello, it's Mr. McGregg with a leg for an arm and an arm for a leg. <laughs> and finally, we end the show with Homer in his bed. We get that pop-up window of his heart once again, this time beating healthily and oddly enough to the rhythm of the Simpsons theme song. The Simpsons family overlooks through the glass, and it's actually great whenever they get to the part at the end of the song Homer actually has the pound on his chest to get it going again. It gets to the break with the da 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 bump 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 bump, and he has to actually pound out the dun 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 part. <laughs> a touching end to a touching moment. It was a good one, and again, I like that they brought back the like picture and picture thing with the heart. I thought that was clever. One little interesting fact about this ending, though, both David Silverman and Mike Carrington remember them going with a different ending as the final ending of the show, but the one that they remembered was not there on this DVD set. It's the ending that we both reviewed. However, they both remember that they had ended the show with Homer having a slice of pizza and the Simpsons family doing a callback joke to when he was a baby. Marge would ask, how did he get the pizza in there? And a nurse would be walking by and would just shrug, and they would roll the credits. Oh, I would have loved that. Yeah, they, they don't know. They honestly, in the commentary, they actually said they don't have any idea why that ending wasn't used. They both thought that was the ending that they went with. Oh, man, that's just funny just to think about it. I'll totally admit, on occasion, I've accidentally sent in like a rough draft of this podcast, and like it's made air, and I had to pull it off. 
and resubmit the other, the, the corrected version. So it's kind of funny in my mind to think of the fact that maybe they submitted the episode. It was good enough as is, so nobody had any questions. And they were long gone working on the next project before they ever even realized it was a, an issue. <laughs> that is funny to think about. It's just, I mean, we're all human, right? We're all a little Homer, right? Every one of us has at least some Homer in us. If you, uh, if you don't think so, you are lying to yourself. But that does end Homer's Triple Bypass. Richie, was there anything that you or that book would like to point out about this episode? I did want to point out, I don't remember if we actually got to say the Wiggum quote from the beginning when they were chasing Snake. But again, it was one of those moments where, where Wiggum can't quite call it incorrectly where he said, this is Papa Bear, put out an APB for a male suspect driving a car of some sort, heading in the direction of, uh, you know, that place that sells chili. Suspect is hatless. Repeat, hatless. And I just want to make sure we got that in there. And then with the great part, too, that's actually right when they transition to Homer in bed. And Homer's like, I sure hope they catch that hatless criminal or the hatless <laughs> perk or whatever he, whatever he says. <laughs> but uh, Snake, my, my book, The Simpsons, A Complete Guide to Your Favorite Family, points out that Snake's license plate actually reads X-Con at this point. <laughs> and there, there's cows outside of his house on Evergreen Terrace. And then the only other thing we didn't mention that the guidebook does is the puppets that Homer uses to describe his coronary bypass operation. <laughs> they look like the life in hell's Akbar and Jeff without oh. the fez. I did not know that. That's a, that's a cool fact. Yeah. Weird that Matt Groening didn't point that out on the director's commentary. Again, there's some times where I'm not quite sure if the guidebook's always 100% correct. Actually, I know it's not always 100% correct, but I just want to point it out that it, it says that in here, so... Yeah, if, if it's a mistake, it's theirs, it's not ours, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> I said at the beginning, I enjoyed this episode, and I found a lot more than I remembered having in there. I just think overall, the, this isn't one of the best episodes of the season, by any means. And I, I think it's just a little bit of the content. It wasn't as, advent as adventurous as The Simpsons will be over the next few seasons, especially in the next episode, which I guess this one will falter mostly because it follows probably what will be my favorite episode of the season. And that is kind of a negative to bring that up when it's not this episode's fault but it just wasn't one of my favorites i still it's still fun to watch and i would watch it again it's just for the the bar that's been set the last few weeks i think this one fell a little short i hear what you're saying and i can understand when you compare it to say mr plow and monorail i don't think it's over those two but i still think this one's going to compete for a spot in the bottom of my top five just because I really enjoy these story arcs when they take something very, very serious and they give it just the right amount of Simpsons touch so that I don't think I was ever concerned that Homer was really going to die, but I think they still did a good job of making you feel what the family was going through in that instance. And again, still finding a way to make it very, very funny. Not as funny as some of the upper other episodes, but very similar to what I said at the end of Lisa's first word. It was very funny, but mostly had a lot to do with heart. In this case, it had a lot of heart in a completely different way. <laughs> Triple the heart. Triple the heart. But yeah, no, just the, the heaviness of this episode, juxtaposed with the humor. I, I really enjoy when they're able to pull that off in, in such a fun way. Uh, we're only about halfway through the season, so there's a, a strong chance that this will get bumped out of the top five. But for now, I would say it's definitely a contender. Fair enough. So that will do it for this week's Best Darn Diddly Review Show. Richie, is there anything you want to plug before we get out of here? As always, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at the Wiz underscore kid 23. Also, while you're on Twitter, go ahead and give our show page a follow. That's at Best Darn Diddly. That's D-I-D-D-L-Y. And also check out on YouTube Camp Crystal Crew and go ahead and subscribe to that channel as well for some fun videos. I am at Mr. Most Days Off on both Twitter and Instagram, and for you wrestling fans, specifically you Lucha Underground fans, come check me out on Voices of Wrestling, where Chris Govenbrino and I break down each week Lucha Underground on Lucha of the Hidden Temple. Again, that's at VoicesOfWrestling.com. Other than that, Richie and I, along with all three wrestle nerds, look forward to being back with you for the episode Marge vs. the Monorail. Bye, everybody. And until next time, be cromulent to each other.
Hello everyone, it's Mr. Most Days Off from the Best Darn Diddly Review Show, here to talk to you about PopThreads.com. PopThreads.com has all of the pop culture t-shirts you're looking for. Movies, TV shows, politics, sports, WWE, and of course, The Simpsons. And right now, you can help out our show and save 15% on your order just by using the discount code SIMPSONS at checkout. So head over to PopThreads.com right now, buy yourself a badass new t-shirt, and help our show out in the process. Thank you so much for listening to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show, and thank you for supporting our sponsor, PopThreads.com.